if we're making space for people who actually want to say something in the media, rather than being empty-headed, vapid, Sarah Palin repeaters, then I think we might want to make some room for Tom Hartman. Now, Tom Hartman doesn't need much, much introduction here because he is on the radio in Madison every day on 92.1. And on XM and Sirius and all that satellite stuff, I cannot figure out. Um, and he has written 22 books, uh, which I know most of you already own. However, if you do not own all 22, you might want to start with unequal protection, how corporations became people, and how you can fight back, which is an exceptionally important book. He anticipated the Citizens United ruling, and he's leading the fight to turn it around. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome one of the greatest talk show hosts ever, the best progressive talk show host I know in Madison, my friend Tom Hartman. McCain-Feingold originally put limitations on the ability of people to uh, self-finance their elections. Those got knocked down by the Supreme Court two and a half years ago, three years ago, and then it also put limits on, on corporate participation in, in, in politics, and that, of course, got knocked down in January of this year in the Citizens United decision. But there's a couple of things that most people don't realize, and it's really important as just like sort of foundational civics 101 that I just want to lay this stuff out. I know a lot of you who listen to the program may know this, but it, it's, it bears repeating in a, in a relatively short and tight form so that you can share it with others as well. The first is that of the three branches of government, the legislative, the House and the Senate, the executive, the president, and all those offices under, you know, the part of the cabinet and all that, and the, le and the judicial, the judiciary, the, the, the Supreme Court at the head of that, the judiciary is actually far and away the most powerful. Now, this was not the intent of the founders. There is nothing in the Constitution of the United States that says that the Supreme Court has the power or even the right to tell Congress that a law that they passed and tell the President that a bill that he signed into law is not consistent with the Constitution and has to be knocked down. <laughs> nothing. John Adams in 1800, when he lost the election of 1800, it was referred to as the Revolution of 1800. In fact, there were people who were afraid he, wasn't gonna, he was going to refuse to leave office. He was such a crotchety, curmudgeony conservative. And he hated Thomas Jefferson at that point. They were not speaking to each other. Jefferson had, had been his vice president. On the day, two years earlier, when, when uh, John Adams signed the Alien and Sedition Acts, John, uh, Thomas Jefferson left town pointedly as a, as, a, as a statement of protest. They had huge battles with each other. And so John Adams, on the last day of his presidency, as a final screw you to Thomas Jefferson, appointed Thomas Jefferson's most ardent political foe and third cousin, John Marshall, to be Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. And for the next 20 some odd years, John Marshall sat on the Supreme Court issuing all sorts of weird and bizarre opinions that radically reshaped America. And the first was in 1803. And it was in a case called Marbury versus Madison. And in that case, Justice John Marshall, Supreme Court Chief Justice John Marshall, ruled, decided, said that the court could take upon itself the power to liquidate, to eliminate, to destroy, to take off the books laws that have been passed by the Congress and the President because the court in its infinite wisdom had decided that in some way they conflicted with the Constitution. A power, as I said, that was not in the Constitution. When, when, when this decision came down, Thomas Jefferson wrote a, wrote a letter to his old friend, um, I'm forgetting his name, but he was the, uh, the father-in-law father of Patrick Henry, um, who was a dear friend of his, and he wrote a letter to him in which he said, if this decision is allowed to stand, the Constitution has become a fellow de se, which is Latin for a suicide pact. He said, if this decision is allowed to stand, the judiciary will mold the Constitution like a thing of wax in its hands, and the will of the people will be lost for generations. He was right. And, and we have seen this over and over again. People say, oh, the Supreme Court, it's not all that important. It's not that big a deal. And, and, and what does this have to do with Democrats and Republicans in the White House? Well, let me get to that and let me explain this. 
In the 18 teens, the Supreme Court, there were, you know, Teddy Roosevelt was uh, at least toward the end of his presidency fairly progressive, and there were a lot of legislative efforts to do things like ban child labor. Now, certainly some of it was because Adults didn't want them competing, but there was also a compassionate part of it. To ban child labor, to make a, a the 50-hour work week was a rallying cry. You know, we think 40 is a big deal. It was 50 back then, 50-hour work week. You know, time and a half for overtime, things like this. The Supreme Court ruled every single one of those things unconstitutional and knocked them down. Go back and look at the history of that era, the slaughterhouse cases and others, all these, these, these Supreme Court cases. And the Supreme Court has so much power that if tomorrow, the majority of the justices, five out of the nine justices, if tomorrow five out of the nine justices said, you know, in the preamble of the Constitution where it cites the six reasons why this Constitution was formed, and one of them says to promote the general welfare, and it actually capitalizes general and capitalizes welfare, which was a way of, like, emphasizing them. For example, defense is not capitalized. They were, it was literally their way of saying this is more important than that. That when they said that, they included health care, and health care is a right and not a privilege. Okay? If the Supreme Court said that tomorrow, it would be the law. Congress would have to pass a bill that would, that would then give us national single-payer health care, and Tim Carpenter and I and everybody else, the Progressive Democrats for America, you know, we could take a nap. That's how powerful they are. And it's, it's, it, this is, and, 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 and people like don't get it. Now, the Republicans got it. And back in the late 60s, early 70s, they created this thing called the Federalist Society. Now, more than half of all judges in the United States are Federalist Society members. The Federalist Society is this right-wing indoctrination society that has a number of members on the Supreme Court that works to create basically right-wing judges, right-wing lawyers, right-wing the, the whole thing. And uh, John Roberts, a product of this and, and, and like this. And so how do we get, given that the court system inappropriately and arguably illegally. I mean, you know, the, the Tea Partiers are like, oh, let's roll back the 17th Amendment, let's roll back the 10th Amendment, or not the 10th, the 21st, you know, I mean, they've, they've got their list of things. I'd roll back Marbury versus Madison. I mean, let's start at the beginning. But in any case, if, if, if we're going to really make fundamental change and have real power in the United States, we've got to start paying attention to the courts. And this means, and this means, to a large extent, having Democrats in positions of power where they can appoint judges. Now, tragically, only about 10% of judges in the United States are appointed anymore. The Republicans have been pushing hard, conservatives harder and harder and harder, year after year, decade after decade, and we're now up to the point where almost 90% of judges are elected, and increasingly, judiciary elections are, are elections for judgeships, even at the local and county level, are becoming far more, more and more expensive. It can cost a million bucks to become a, to, to, to become a $65,000 a year judge in rural Mississippi. I mean, it's, it's that bizarre, because those judges have the power to control whether or not the EPA can actually enforce rules against oil companies. So guess who's putting those judges into place? Guess who's paying the, 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 the fees for the judges? So, yeah, exactly. So, to bring this back around to Barack Obama and to contemporary politics, I have a long list of complaints about the President of the United States, about Mr. Obama, about President Obama. You know, I, the, the health care bill was wussy, the, the bank bill didn't break up the two, you know, I can give you the long list. But here's, first of all, you know, he's a hell of a lot better than George Bush. But here's, here's, here's the really important thing, and this is what I want to leave you with, because this is, I can't, I can't, there, it is impossible to overstate how important this is. The swing vote in the Senate, in the, on the Supreme Court right now is Justice Kennedy, and Justice Kennedy is probably going to be the next one to retire or, God forbid, to die. I don't wish him poorly, but um, it, he's the, he, and, and it's probably not going to be in the next year or two. It's probably going to be in the next four or five or six years. He's just of that age. And if a Republican is in the White House, when that happens, you ain't seen nothing yet. I mean, literally, we could see back, back to the 19-teens the repeal of laws that allow unionization, the repeal of, by the Supreme Court, talk about judicial activism. I mean, you've got people on the bench like Scalia who are already talking about this stuff. You could see the repeal. He thinks, Scalia thinks that it is wrong that the government says that you can't work, 
that if you work more than a 40 hour a week that you have to be compensated extra for. He thinks it's wrong that there are, much like Rand Paul, that the government would involve itself in things like child labor. That should simply be between the employer and the employee. We should have that, you know, all these kind of things. He, he's an originalist, right? And, and of course, originally, when this country was founded, the age of consent was seven. Uh, children typically went to work around nine or ten, unless they were seven-year-olds who went into prostitution, which was not uncommon at that time. I mean, that's, that's the world Scalia wants. That's the world he's driving us towards. And so, bottom line, just to, just to put it in a nutshell, the bottom line is that regardless of how wonderful or not wonderful President Obama may be, and he, he has done many good things, let me just acknowledge that. The most important thing right now is that, is that A, secondarily important, we try to hold control of the House and Senate in this election and in 2012, and B, that in the 2012 election, and we all need to be preparing for it, because I'm telling you, the Republicans, half of what's going on right now, particularly all this Muslim stuff, this is set up to knock down Obama in 2012. It, that in 2012, we have a Democrat in the White House until 2016. It must be. And that's only going to happen one way, and that's if you and I get active, tag, you're it. We'll see you.